What an interesting venue. Yeah. This is our um, living room. Oh, boy. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the event. Just a brief plug before we start. I think you all got flyers, but we have Representative Con um, Luis Gutierrez at Ida Noyes tomorrow at 9.30 in conversation with Abel to Axelrod. So, great event. Hope to see you there again. But now, for this event, um, I can sit. Sure. <laughs> uh, this is Cole Bowen. I'm sure you guys know who he is, but just a brief refresher. <laughs> Uh, a former research associate um, at Harvard Business School and associate economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, Cole Bowen began his career with The Onion in 2006 as a headline contributor. He went on to work his way up to features editor, then head writer, before becoming the publication's editor in 2014. Founded in 1988, The Onion is a satirical news source that reports on international, national, and local stories. For anyone who isn't 100% familiar with what The Onion does, here is a short clip um, about The Onion and its role in American society. You're not reading the onion, you're doing something wrong. Somehow, when you say the words the onion, it resonates with people. The next Peabody goes to the most venerated, the most prestigious network. Uh, it is the Onion News Network. Parody has never been so sharp, so precise, so perfectly performed. We sat in on one of the Onion's editorial meetings, and it seems no one and nothing is safe from the Onion's reach. My favorite headline today after the election was the Onion. Black man gets worst job in world. <laughs> the satirical newspaper, The Onion, recently ran a headline that struck a nerve because I think it's all true true. It read, quote, recession plague nation demands new bubble to invest in. I hear that you're the uh, best news reader in the mm -hmm. world. I do call myself that, but only because also people tell me all the time uh -huh. that I'm fantastic at it. I sense that there is a news reading challenge and it's on. Out of bounds, NFL star Brett Favre fined $50,000. Following, I'd like to point that out again. I did say Favre fined 50,000 following. You know what would be a great onion headline? Yeah. Cancer prevents cancer. <laughs> 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 That's so onion. It's so you, but it's also so onion. Oh. All right. Oh, All right. So we've had a brief refresher in the onion. Um, welcome, and thank you so much for coming oh, to no Politics. My pleasure. So. It's a lovely living room you've got here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so why do you think that young people in particular connect to satirical news sources like The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, and The Onion? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I think, I mean, I think more than anything we're, we're funny, and that's actually what we, that's like our main goal, first off, is to try to make people laugh. Um, people sometimes try to put this label on us as if we're, Social commentary is our end-all, be-all, which, which is very much a part of what we do. But uh, we really like to entertain people as well. I think it's important to remember that. Everyone gets really high, and I think everyone's excited to hear me talk about politics and stuff like that. But we really, we really like making people laugh, um, which I think is a good thing. But in terms of, of like millennials or whoever who, who flocked to The Onion or Jon Stewart or anything like that, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe you would give a better answer to that than I would. Um, I, I think a lot of people turn to us because they're a little fed up with the regular media um, and that we're just, um, even though we're, we're telling things with jokes, we're a little more truthful than, or we cut to the truth a little, a little uh, easier. We cut to the heart of the matter a little cleaner than, than other journalistic outlets. Do you have any, do you have any insight as to why uh, young people would turn to the onion? <laughs> Maybe, but then it's not about me. Uh, okay. um, uh, no, but what would you say, like, would you argue that satire elevates the national political discussion? Yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about before. I think people put a lot of emphasis on what we do, and I think we do draw a lot of attention to certain issues. And we do, um, for every day before we start writing our headlines, all of our stories start with a headline. It has to be a solidly constructed headline, and then we write the story from it. So everyone comes in every day with this, this list of headlines, which we read off. And each night I'll send out um, an email to the staffers being like, these are the things that are in the news that we should have a comment on. These are the things that um, we should make a statement about. Um, so I think we're, we're good at um, you know, raising awareness of certain things or, or putting certain um, feelings into words that people have. Um, but I don't know if we elevate uh, the discussion. I think we, we just broaden it. Elevating, elevating puts us a little 
on a, on a high pedestal. <laughs> um, but on that note, so you're not journalists, but so when you want to accurately satirize a topic or person, you have to know a lot about them. Mm -hmm. So do your writers, like, what goes into writing a piece that's so complex when you do take those on? Sure. Well, I want to point out that um, you look at our, our headlines, and they can be crazy. They can be wacky mm -hmm. worlds. Um, and they're absolutely insane. They're so, so very heightened. But the thing is, except for that joke, the joke part of the headline, every, every other detail in there is accurate. Mm -hmm. And if those details aren't accurate, um, it detracts from, right. from, from the story. So it has to be essentially an AP news story, but with you know, the <laughs> regular, the thing that we're satirizing taking, uh, taken out in our like, hyperbolic crazy world thrown in. Um, so we do take, we, we are very serious. We do do a lot of fact checking to make sure that our, our articles are correct. So your writers will actually go to like primary sources to find stuff out? No. <laughs> we're, we're not that committed to accuracy. Uh, we're committed to Wikipedia level accuracy. Fair enough. Uh, so no, definitely not. <laughs> uh, so Jon Stewart is one of the reasons that Crossfire was taken off the air. Stephen Colbert, Col Colbert began a super PAC. Um, is there a time that you think The Onion has purposely or accidentally influenced national politics? Um, I, don't, I really, this is a thing where I, I, people seem to give us so much credit, and I, I don't know if we, if we do do that. Um, I do think that Colbert doing a super PAC is an example of, of, you know, raising awareness of something and showing how absurd something is um, through, in that, in that case, like a satirical event, um, whereas we just do satirical news. Um, but I would even say that Colbert didn't, like, shape or, I don't know, change the national agenda or mindset or anything. I think he just pointed out um, a flaw, pointed out just an absurdity uh, in our world. And that's what I think, I think we do very well, is point out absurdities. Is there an article you've written or edited that you're particularly proud of for doing that? Oh, God, yeah, a lot. Um, there's, there's a ton of articles that I'm proud of. Um, I've edited a whole bunch. Uh, there's one of them right after... We're, we're quite well known for uh, our coverage immediately after national tragedies of, mm -hmm. of uh, which is a little weird because there, it, like you can see our web traffic rise, and we feel extremely guilty about um, you know getting web traffic on awful days. Uh, but we did one after like the Newtown shooting, but the one after the University of California Santa Barbara shooting um, was one of my favorites of the past year or so, two years maybe now. Um, which was no way to prevent this. Says only na only nation in world where this happens, um, which I thought was a, a very good headline and made a, a very strong point. And it just points out how kind of what we would say dumb people would say is like, oh, you can't do this. This guy had access, like whatever. Like his circumstances led him to do this, and there was nothing that could have stopped him. Like, well, there's crazy people in other parts of the world, and this doesn't happen. Clearly, there's something that we need to address. Um, and I thought we did that extremely well. With that particular piece. And I could go on with a million different pieces if you'd like, but let's keep it moving. Come on. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so on the flip side of that, in the past, the Indian has apologized for some tweets, headlines, articles. Uh, so bring, <laughs> me into the, <laughs> bring me into the newsroom. Um, so what's the discussion when that happens? Well, that happened one time. Uh, we've never apologized except for one tweet that we did a few okay. years ago. Um, and that was, that was a mess up on our part. We, have, we actually have We've probably done, I don't know, 100,000 jokes over the years um, in terms of like headlines and tweets and like uh, our American Voices, Man on the Street type interviews. Um, that was one where, and we have extremely high standards, and I should talk about our high standards. Um, we are, one of our like founding credos is that uh, nothing is off limits as long as we find the right angle on it. Like, that's why I think we get so much attention after national tragedies is that people are saying, like, you can't comment on it. Like, there's so many too soon comments. Um, and we think that's, like, the most appropriate time to talk about um, something like gun control, maybe, after, after a mass shooting, immediately after. That's an important time to talk about it. Um, it's an important time to make cathartic statements about how the nation feels. Um, so we're, we're completely, like, open. We always want to make a comment about anything, um, as long as we find the right take, the right angle. Uh, so we actually go back and forth in every meeting, really, um, because we're a satire news organization. We tend to push the boundaries sometimes of propriety. Um, and we have long discussions about whether something is wrong-headed. 
whether it's um, like making fun of a victim, we call that punching downward, and that just comes off as mean a lot of the time, or whether it's punching upward at someone in authority, someone who's hypocritical, uh, someone who's making the rules and violating them. Like that's, that's what we always want to do. We always want to ridicule hate uh, and uh, you know, hypocrisy, stuff like that, intolerance, greed, et cetera, selfishness. Um, so we have long discussions about whether things are right-headed or wrong-headed. And we have a very good track record, I think, of, of being on the right side. That particular tweet that you're referring to was one that didn't go so well. Uh, it was a joke we made about Kravinjane Wallace, um, and it sort of cast her as the opposite of what she is. And we do that a lot. It's like a, a tried and true formula to be like, we had around that same time Dick Van Dyke comes out as Zodiac Killer, mm -hmm. um, which is that sort of thing. And our George Bush character before 9-11 uh, was this really smart guy. It was like Bush Bush finds error in Fermilab calculations, and like <laughs> Bush, wows, Bush wows dinner guests with impromptu oratory on Virgil's minor works. Um, so in that one, we, we did this thing where we cast her as like this catty um, Hollywood type, and it didn't land poorly, and it, largely because I think she was very young, but it didn't have the context of a news story with it. It was just this tweet that went out into the world with no context. And, um, mm -hmm. It, it violated our rules. I, I think it came across as potentially uh, punching downward. So I think we, we have these long discussions about whether things are right-headed or wrong-headed, and we really, really put a lot of effort into trying to be right-headed. Um, and I think we're really good, except for, except for that instance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so other than punching upward, what would you say characterizes good satire? Uh, good satire. Well, I think punching upward is exactly what it is. It has a clear target. I think... Uh, when you sort of read poor satire, it's it's unclear. Like there's a lot of websites in the world now that claim to be satire, but they're just sort of plausible lies. Um, <laughs> you see these a lot on your newsfeed. There's like nothing potential. There's nothing really humorous about them, and there's not like some insight that's that's being delivered to the audience. I think what we do is give that insight, and you're like, oh, that's a joke. Um, whereas something, <laughs> and usually you laugh or, or whatever, um, but a lot of these things that you see online nowadays are just like Boston bomber beaten to death in cell block or something, which is just a lie. There's like no nuance, there's no insight, there's nothing particularly funny about it. It's just empty. Um, so I think what we're very good at is providing insight with our jokes. On that note, um, what is, outside of your realm, what is the funniest TV show on right now? It's Rick and Morty. I don't know if anyone's okay. watched Rick and Morty, but it's undeniably Rick and Morty. Uh, it's very funny. It has, it's kind of satire. Yeah, it is actually satire, but it's yeah. an animated thing on... What is it on? I've watched it on... Cartoon Network, I think. Cartoon Network or something like that. I believe. Everyone should watch it. It's really I funny. had to ask. Cool. Um, so, as a satirist, uh, which 2016 campaigns are you most excited about following? Oh, jeez. <laughs> that that's good. We actually had... Um, We've had some stuff about the people who have who've declared already. We had like a primer on who is Ted Cruz, who is Marco Rubio. Um, but the thing that we got a huge response to last weekend or the weekend before was our, our Hillary Clinton piece, which was like, Hillary Clinton to nation, colon quote, do not fuck this up for me. Um, which sort of made fun of her video where she was just like jabbing at the screen, just being like, don't dick me over like you did in 2008. Um, so surprisingly, even though she's like a part of the establishment and been around for a long time, I think she'll be, she'll be pretty fun to, to riff off of. Which is good because Democrats tend to be harder sometimes to riff off of. Yeah, has she humbled herself enough? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do you personally get your news from? I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, the New York Times, I guess, mm -hmm. is mainly where I get my, my news. But the thing is, when I send out these lists of what we should sort of, what I think our writers should try to write headlines about, um, it's usually just like Google News, which just has so much, mm -hmm. takes things from everywhere. You can sort of see what's in the zeitgeist at the current time. Yeah, like the Facebook scroll. The Facebook scroll is actually kind of helpful on the yeah. side because that sort of like breaks news during the day. You're like, oh, wow. 
Um, yeah, so the Facebook scroll. I get my news from that Facebook <laughs> on the right side. That's embarrassing. Please, please edit this out. <laughs> well, so on the topic of real news organizations, um, so from the New York Times, the China's People Daily, the internet has been mistaken for like a real news source and quoted mm -hmm. as such. What's your reaction when that happens? It, that's a good question. Uh, I really like it when when big things take us as as real news stories. Like if there's something lost in translation, it's actually really quite funny. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the earliest ones was this Chinese newspaper in the late, maybe it's early 2000s or late 90s. Um, we did a story on Congress threatening to leave Washington unless a new capital was built, which was pretty much just a parody of when a football or baseball team wants to leave. <laughs> Um, and Congress was demanding that the new capital had a retractable dome. <laughs> and we even had like a drawn schematic of, of what that looked like. And this Chinese newspaper ran the whole thing, including the image. And they were just like, look at these, look at these capitalists in America. Look how, look how awful they are. Um, and when they found out that it was you know, a satirical uh, article, the next day, instead of, instead, of, um, instead of apologizing or retracting the story, they just wrote, in America, newspapers are allowed to tell lies. <laughs> okay. So that, that stuff's hilarious. And we've had we've had like a Bangladeshi newspaper um, ran with this story, which was conspiracy theorists convinced Neil Armstrong moon landing was fake. Um, we had one which was like a poll about rural Americans preferring Ahmadinejad to Obama, which this Fars news agency in Iran picked up. Um, there are a couple other, oh, our sexiest man alive for 2012 was Kim yeah. Jong-un. <laughs> uh, the People's Daily in China ran and they, they did a 55 photo spread with it, which is a, a lot of pictures of Kim Jong-un on horseback in that one. Uh, so those are really funny. And we did this thing a number of years ago, which was Planned Parenthood introduces, or Planned Parenthood unveils $2 billion or $8 billion abortion plex or something like that, which had like all these abortion places and IMAX theaters and a lazy river and stuff like that. Um, and these women were like, oh, I can't wait to have another abortion so I can get, come back here, which was a play on this, the thing that was going on in Congress at the time where a bunch of congressmen were trying to defund Planned Parenthood because they were saying all it does is abortions. And actually, there was just like a, a very small fraction, like, I don't know, 5% of, of their allies. So those are, and oh, and that, I didn't get to the good part of that, which is that Congressman John Fleming of Louisiana um, posted that on his Facebook feed as real, and he wrote something like, another, more abominations from Planned Parenthood, abortion by the wholesale. Um, so I like it when people like that get fooled, but when it's everyday people who, who do it, which is um, quite a number of people on Facebook, it's actually pretty disappointing because we put a lot of effort into crafting our jokes, mm -hmm. and uh, we think they're good, and we think they're funny, and it, if people just swallow it, it's a... Uh, it, it, I don't know, it, it reflects poorly on them, first off. Yeah. Um, but it also makes us feel bad because the, we want them to get the joke. We want them to see that this is, we're trying to, to make an insight, like I was saying before. Right, because satire can offer catharsis if you know what's going on. But if you don't, it can also be kind of informative um, in yeah. a weird way. Yeah, sure. Do you ever feel like you have a responsibility to inform? Do I? No, I don't think we have any responsibility, really. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the closest thing I feel to a responsibility is that our readers who we care about a lot, who are very loyal and who are, are a pretty smart group, I would say. Um, they just like to hear what we have to say on certain big events. And so I feel a responsibility to be like, oh, this is something we should comment on. Not because I have any illusions that it's going to affect policy or anything like that, but because um, I think, you know, people, people care. And I think that we articulate things in a way that um, really resonates with people. Hmm. Um, stepping back to comedy in general, why do you think that that profession is so male-driven? God, I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, maybe it has something to do with societal ideals of, of like what we push men towards and confidence and being able to speak up in a room. I can tell you it's extremely hard um, to go into our writer's room and read off your headline list one after the other and just get cold silence after each one. And then when you finally get one, people will just say, yeah, okay, that's good. And then you highlight it, and then you move on to the next one. You just have to be extremely comfortable with rejection. Um, so maybe there's something with, I don't know, I, I can't get into why there's more men, but maybe there's just values placed on confidence in, in males. Um, I can say that we, we love when we have people with all sorts of different perspectives in the room. I think it um, really gives us, it really rounds out our voice. 
Um, and I wish we had more women, and I wish that the women that on our staff wouldn't leave and go to TV shows. <laughs> um, but they're very, very talented, and they go, they've, they've just been leaving because you get way more money in television. Mm -hmm. And they're very, they're very good. We could use more. Yeah, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but in Split Sider in 2014, that interview, you talked about how it's like, you need constant validation working as a comedy writer. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's not just a comedy writer. I think any comedian just mm -hmm. needs constant validation. We're all very, uh, you know, needy people. We all have, I'm trying to please all of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like as editor, you like, you finally satisfied that need? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to ask you, what do you think is the most underreported news story today? Underreported news yeah. story? Oh boy, uh, these are, these are hard-hitting questions. <laughs> I should have prepared for these. I don't know. Uh, I would say think, like there are things so often that I'm just sort of amazed, don't, or like are just flashes in the pan in the news cycle and then disappear. Um, so there's probably a million of those that have evaporated from my mind, but things like antibiotic resistance and stuff like that seems like something that, man, people should be, like, think about this all the time and think about how it shapes their world and think about how this could affect us in the future. Um, and I just feel like there's so many of these things that bubble up from time to time and then just evaporate, and they're still, like, threats. So, uh, antibiotic resistance at <laughs> Final all. answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. No, yeah. I Because satire often brings... Uh, the public eye back to those things when it's forgotten about them with like these really pithy headlines because it, it makes it digestible, you know? You can sure. read it that way. Yeah, I think that's good. And I, that's sort of what we try to do when something bubbles up. We try to have a comment on it. Um, but like I was saying, sometimes it evaporates from our minds too and just gets lost in the static. Do you ever think about something like that, like a story that you might want to write about? And is there like a formula you can put it into? Is there, like, is there a formula for a great Onion article? Um, that's... That's a good question. There's certain joke formulas that we reuse, but uh, there's there's no like I can't just look at something and say, oh, I know exactly what headline format would work for this, or I know exactly what this one would have to be done as an op-ed as opposed to a regular news article. Um, I think that's just a matter of feel for each writer, and each writer would approach something differently. Um, so I don't think there is any like you can't force any issue into some rubric. You have to figure out what angle on it you think is best and then come up with a fresh headline from that angle. Yeah. Sorry. There's no formula, guys. <laughs> oh, it's only been a job. Okay. Well, um, I'll now open it up to questions. We'll take them first from students and then from the rest. So does anyone have anything to start with? Real? I'll keep asking, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, I guess, you know, the Onion recently watched Click All Up, I guess it was about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, but how do you think of that as being satirical in kind of the same ways as the Onion or different ways, and, and does that have any kind of fun? Sure, yeah, I think Click is great. If anyone hasn't seen Click you should check out Click I think it's the funniest website on uh, the internet right now. Um, the Click was basically formed because the Onion is an August news source. We are, our, our competition, our only competition is the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, and we will crush them. Uh, but basically, we're, we consider ourselves above making jokes about like uh, what we would call low-hanging fruit, like about celebrity culture like on a daily basis, about you know something like Kim Kardashian breaking the internet is something we wouldn't comment on, The Onion. That's beneath us. That's beneath a very respectable news organization, newspaper like ourselves. Um, but you know, there's all that kind of stuff in the news. There's all these like BuzzFeed quizzes and shareable things you see all the time. But basically, there's this whole segment of the way people are consuming information on the internet that we, as the onion, can't really hit. Um, so we created Clickhole to just take on all that viral crap that's all over Facebook feeds and Twitter, etc. Um, and I think it's very similar to The Onion in that it has the same sensibilities. The uh, editor of Clickhole is a former senior writer of ours, um, and a lot of the guys and uh, girls, one girl, who work on it are former Onion people. And they're, um, I think they take our sensibility and just apply it to this very stupid world of, of online shareable stuff that doesn't have as much um, impact as, you know, the daily daily big things in the news, um, but it's just funny, funny and vapid, <laughs> and I love it. I think it's hilarious. 
Check it out. Check it out quick hole. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you thought the best satire had some sort of an insight. Yes. That was always a part of the article. Considering click hole, the insight always seems to just be, this is all vapid nonsense. Is there, do you think there's any subtlety to the insights that click hole can give, or is it uh, just sort of a one note? Yeah, you're, you're kind of right. Um, I think there are some insights in individual articles, but I think the form in general is pretty much just making fun of the basic format that stuff on the internet takes right now. So you're right, it's like a, whereas we a lot of times satirize journalistic convention in how journalists, uh, like declining journalistic standards or something like that, uh, Clickhole's main satirical um, target is just the vapidness of, of, of online junk like that. Um, but there's, there are a few articles that I think are, make pretty good points about, you know, bullying sometimes, or there's one about, uh, yeah, there's a bullying one, there's one about like teen suicide or something like that. So they can do it, but for the most part they're just very dumb things. And something like ISIS, which they'll comment on, they just have the dumbest comment on ISIS in the world. It's just kind of, just funny. Um, so just now you mentioned the onions or um, targeted audience or some stories the onion con considers itself above its report. Oh yeah. Is the onion elitist? In other words, um, does the onion have a target audience that are well-educated, relatively privileged people who would found, find its stories funny, while the rest may not, or even find it offensive, but they are not what uh, onion cares about anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. That's a good question. I, I think um, I think we like to think that we're not elitist. Um, I mean, we just tend, I think we write smart humor, and I think that attracts smarter people or savvier people or people who get the joke. Um, so I think by that, by the nature of that, we're just going to attract, we're not going to attract a subset of people who simply just don't get the joke, um, except for sometimes when they share it because they actually think it's real, which we, we don't want. Like, we don't want them to do that because that's that's not what we're in the business of. So I think just by nature of what we do, we're going to attract, you know, a, a better educated group. And that might turn out to be a group that's not completely representative of the population. Um, was there more to that question? I'm sorry. Did okay. I answer it? Was I close? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, could I uh, follow up very quickly? Um, sure. Um, earlier you mentioned um, one of the core ingredients of satire is to punch upward. Yes. Um, are there instances, for example, when your, your intended target is something upward, like a mighty religious organization, yeah. but the actual effect was you offended people who were actually downward? Uh, we offend people all day. Like, we get, <laughs> we get so many emails from people who are offended, and I think um, it's not bad to offend if, if we think that ultimately the the target of the joke is justified. Um, like I think people are just too sensitive about a lot of things and that they have these sacred cows that they don't want to be tread on. And like we get so many um, emails that are like, I love what the onion does, but this time you went too far. <laughs> Which is like, well, no, we didn't. That's, that's different for every person. And so we try to be an equal opportunity, not a fender <coughs> per se, but we try to be, we try to spread our um, targets around so that we can target everything. I think people in general can just sh should should just shrug, shrug it off a little a little more. Um, I know a couple of years ago you guys used to have a feature like in the know. Uh, yeah, those in type the know. of really funny features. Um, when do you guys decide to retire those features? You mean in the know like the um, like the video? The like, yeah, the video. Duncan know. Birch and yeah, those exactly. guys? Yeah, they're running Clifford Baines. Clifford Baines. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're good. This is, this is, a, this is a good question. Uh, those were ONN things, Onion News Network. And um, there were some internal reasons why we didn't do that. But one of the main reasons is that uh, cable news satire started to feel a little stale in recent years. So we've cut back on it dramatically. It almost feels too jokey and too old of a joke to make fun of CNN at this point. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're trying some different things in that arena. Um, and that said, I think In The Know was one of the funniest, consistently funniest uh, cable news parodies that we did. It's great, if anyone's seen it. Hi. <laughs> 
Um, how is the onion changed? Uh, how has the onion adapted to the changing landscape of media? Is Clickhole one response mm -hmm. to that, or is there a new direction in general for onionism? Uh, yeah, we've we've changed a bunch. I mean, one of the the first thing that we did on uh, was about 1996 when we went online, which was actually pretty early for um, a lot of news publications. So I think we've we've been pretty much in step with some big changes. 2000. I can't remember. Six or seven is when we started ONN, which was this cable news parody, which is very good. Clickhole was last year. Um, one thing that we were quite late on, really, was that we we used to be tied to our we used to be a physical newspaper, um, which you could get around here, and we don't do that anymore because no one wants to advertise in print. Um, so we used to be tied to a, a print cycle, and we used to write two weeks ahead of time um, each issue. So when we wanted to comment on something in the news, we had to be sort of like have the definitive late statement about it and summarize it. Uh, we moved to a much more a daily model in 2012, um, which allows us to be, you know, every day we get to write about something that's fresh. Uh, so that's probably the biggest innovation in the past three years. Four years. There's, there's a bunch of people oh, over there. Oh, a bunch over here. Um, yeah. Here, we'll go with you first, then we'll jump back. Kind of related to that, how do you deal with timing of releasing articles? Like, you know, how do you decide how many per day you know, and, and like what's too much, what's too little. Uh, how many per day is dictated by how many the writers get to me for me to edit before I can get out? Um, it depends, like if it's a big news day, if there's a big event, we might do, you know, three or four pieces on that and we'd want them all out on the same day because that's when it's uh, in the news. But on an average day, say we do six articles, short articles usually, uh, one long one, and then some like features like infographics or Written voice and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the, the amount of news that day, with like a baseline of, of like five or six total things. Okay, um, we'll start on the right. Uh, can you speak a little more to becoming comfortable with rejection and failure in the field of comedy or writing? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean to talk about comfort and like in like pitching jokes into a void. Um, I started out at the Onion just by sending stuff <coughs> in unsolicited um, to their to their headquarters. Headquarters. I used the term that you used yeah. for it. Offices. <laughs> uh, it's so I'd read somewhere online about this guy Peter Keckley who got a job there just by sending in jokes to the Onion uh, back when it was in Madison, the Madison days. It started out in Madison, Wisconsin, and stayed there for the first twelve years. Uh, so I was like, oh. I can try to do that. I don't know anyone in comedy. Let's see if I can do that. So I, I just sent jokes in to avoid uh, and didn't hear anything for about five or six months and then just by chance happened to like replicate a joke that was about to appear on the, the website. Um, got a headline very close to what they had done. And from there I started, they asked me to start pitching headlines. And you're just, for, for each of our contributors, the contributors start by pitching headlines. Like I said before, headlines form the foundation of what we do. So you just have to be comfortable sending in a list of 25 headlines and getting a lot of weeks, zero of them in. Um, and not even zero of them in, but zero of them like highlighted to make it to the next day. Because we get about, I think it's about 1,000 to 1,500 headlines a week and we run about 30. So the, the number that we run is, at, is about 2% to 3% of headlines that get pitched actually make it. So when you're looking at you know a 97% rate of failure, you get used to rejection almost immediately. <laughs> um, but yeah, in any, in any type of failure, I mean, I, I feel grateful in a way that I do it uh, in, the privacy, in the privacy, but within a group of friends, 10, 12 friends um, in the writer's room, whereas if I was like a stand-up comedian, I would bomb in front of a whole bunch of people many different nights, so, I, so I'm, I'm actually quite glad that my failure is, is uh, in just a small environment. But anyone in comedy is gonna just has to be okay with failing. Danny, hi. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, you talking about sensitivity earlier, and there's yeah. been a lot of talk lately about like safe spaces on college campuses. Sure. I don't know if you saw that. There's a New York Times article a about a month ago that addressed this kind of like changing youth culture um, mm -hmm. towards the topics that are uh, becoming taboo again. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine that a large portion of your readers are people in their early 20s. Sure. Has The Onion addressed this shift 
in youth culture at all? No, but that's that's you're giving me good ideas of what <laughs> we should do jokes on. I think I think that's uh, that, I think it's incredible. I think that's that's good, and I think that should be something personally that I think should be made fun of. Uh, I think I think any time, even if it is, I guess I don't fully understand what safe space is, so I don't really want to offend anyone um, by by having a wrong impression of it. But if it's some place where what it seems to be sometimes is that you have an insular view of what's acceptable and what's not, that should be made fun of in my mind. Uh, I don't think, even if it's the goal is to protect people, I think uh, you should expose people to all sorts of different ideas, even if they're offensive. Um, I think that's how we learn about a lot of stuff. And I think even even like a, like even if your goal is, is benevolent, um, you, you shouldn't restrict uh, what can and can't be said. And I think this would be great for, for us to write something about that. So thank you. <laughs> Way in the back there. Uh, thanks so much for coming. You discussed earlier about underreported stories. I'm wondering, what do you think about the stories you go underreported? What does that say about the American media? Uh, I think that, uh, this is an interesting question. Um, and I'm going to go in a very tangential direction with this. Um, the article on The Onion that has gotten the most all-time page views is this very silly op-ed. It's not silly, it's actually extremely dry. Um, op-ed that we did from the managing editor of CNN.com right after Miley Cyrus did her twerking like fiasco at the MTV Video Music Awards. And it was basically, the headline was something like, let me explain to you why Miley Cyrus was our top story today. Uh, and that got, it was a very dry takedown of exactly why they would do that, because they wanted the page views, because the page views is what gets the advertising revenue. It talked very in-depth about click rates and bounce rates on the, on the website. Um, and I think that sort of tapped into this, this feeling. The reason that it was the, the most clicked on thing in The Onion's history is that I think it tapped into our readers' feelings about how uh, debased the, the mainstream news organizations had let themselves become, um, and how they were focusing on more sort of flash in the pan, non-stories uh, in an effort to chase clicks. And I think that sort of speaks to maybe something in regards to things that bubble up for a brief period of time and then disappear because, uh, frankly, the, the model that's out there right now for news organizations is not one that rewards that kind of journalism. It's one that rewards sort of awful things that you don't, you really shouldn't be reading about on something like CNN.com. Um, so does that answer your question? <coughs> um, so I'm curious uh, about the AV Club. Has, was that with the paper initially when it started? Because I feel that that's sort of something that really, uh, as, um, as silly as The Onion is, it's, uh, it's impressive how the AV Club is really uh, um, a serious uh, source in terms of uh, media. Sure. Such. Yeah, I, I love the AV Club. The AV Club is, if people don't know, it's uh, it's serious. They report real news um, from the world of pop culture. Um, they were not a, a, initially a part of The Onion. It was really early in the 90s. The Onion was founded in 1988. They came around in the early 90s um, and have been our sister publication ever since. Um, so they weren't there from the beginning, but they do, I do think we have a nice balance of of real stuff, and our audiences overlap a fair amount. Um, so I like the balance that we have, even though you don't see us together anymore in like the newspaper format, which is really fun. You'd read The Onion, then you get to the AV Club. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't do that anymore. Back there. Hi. So um, one of my favorite uh, ways to waste time on the internet is like going on the subreddit, uh, not The Onion. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> and so I guess my question is just what do you you know, make of like media that can sometimes be like self parodying rather than like, you know, um, going after it yourselves? Uh, sure, I haven't been on that subreddit much, but the, I get, you know, like the Onion Google alert will show up in my okay. inbox. And so many people, so many very bad journalistic outlets will say, no, this isn't the Onion, not the Onion. And that's a phrase that is really overused um, and very dumb. Because for the most part, when people say, I can't believe this isn't The Onion, they're not talking about something with, uh, with a lot of nuanced humor. It's usually just something wacky, um, which is not really what we do. So a lot of times when you say, I can't believe this wasn't in The Onion, are you sure this isn't from The Onion? Um, it's a very silly headline that would never have any place in The Onion. It'll be like, you know, man steals 
meat in his pants and walks out of stores and like that. We would never run anything like that. <laughs> it's very dumb and it doesn't say anything. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question at all. But I think that not the onion phrase is overused and, and people uh, should stop using it. Because <laughs> it annoys me. Hi. Yeah, um, what differentiates, in, besides the one is funny and one is not, uh, onion, a, a real onion article versus a sponsored article? Uh, sponsored articles are ones that obviously our sponsor wants us to direct them to their like section that they brought, they bought. But ultimately, those are jokes that were pitched by our contributors or our staff members, so they're usually pretty close to our our standards. We don't want really want to put anything that's an onion article on our web page that's not up to the onion standards. So there. I mean, there have been some in the past which were really atrocious, um, but I think we've gotten pretty good at doing doing good ones. Is there a firewall between advertorials and editorials? Oh God, this is you're touching a nerve here. Uh, there's, I mean, there's. I don't know if you watched this John Oliver thing from a year ago, but they did this um, big church and st church and state in the journalism world, um, the separation of the business side from the editorial side, and how that's being blended to an obscene degree. That's just another thing talking about the way that journalism's moving. Um, which is painful for anyone, not just us, but for people who work in, you know, regular newspapers. It's that's just what clients ask for, and that's how you get money. Um, yeah, that's that's the most upsetting part of my job. But when we do a good one, and I think we've done a lot of a lot of good ones that live up to our standards, I think I'm I'm fine with it. Anyway, you should watch that John Oliver piece about that Church of State because it's fantastic. Um, and it was written by a previous editor in chief who went to the John Oliver show, and you can just see how cathartic it was for him to enjoy <laughs> yeah. for him to write that. Um, Way in the back there. I'm curious about like the day-to-day -day logistics of what's behind the six articles that come out. Like, how many people are working? Are you all in one room? What's the like schedule? Sure. Um, that that's good. Uh, that's a good question. I think people are often surprised when they hear how small our writing staff is. It's nine people. Uh, so pretty much everything you see on there was written by those nine people. We do have a couple writers at large who contribute a lot, and we do have a lot of headline contributors who send in headlines. Um, but most of the headlines and almost all of the articles are written by those nine people on staff. Um, so we're just very, very busy people. I think some people think it's all just like laughing and fun and back slapping and stuff like that. Um, and there's a fair amount of laughing, but it is... It's, it's a place that puts out a lot of stuff for a small amount of people. Um, and the fact that it's ha you have to sort of make a point and be nuanced in each article, it's not the same as like the AV Club, which I'm not saying they're not nuanced and good writers, but they can just write something and put it out a little quicker. We have to get it through an editing cycle to make sure it uh, matches up to the Onion standards, that the jokes are good. Um, so it's, it's a complex process, and we're always very, we're always very busy. But we do get together every morning for a headline meeting, and then we pick the headlines from there as a team. We brainstorm it as a team, and they go out to writers individually to write, and then they send them in to an editor to edit. Um, so there is some room time. There's a lot of solitary time, and there's a lot of solitary time just coming up with headlines on your own. In the middle there. Thanks. Um, so you talked about the importance of context in terms of understanding your humor. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, with the 24-hour news cycle, that context can be lost pretty quickly. So can you talk about sort of how you archive articles? Have you ever removed any because you thought that people wouldn't get them anymore? Or have any come back to bite you because people didn't get them anymore? Uh, there's probably a ton that don't make sense anymore. They're probably reference things that were sort of, like particularly in the last three years when we started moving to the timely model, if we reference something that just disappeared from your mind, like this Michael Dorner, if anyone remembers who Michael Dorner is, he was this guy in California who locked himself in like a cabin, went on like a police manhunt thing. It's like a, a thing that, even though it was big news at the time, is just gone from people's minds. So there's things that probably make no sense to anyone. You're like, what are you talking about? Um, we had him dating uh, Taylor Swift at the time, <laughs> if anyone remembers that. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's probably a ton of stuff like that. There's, I think standards were a little different in the early days. I think there's a lot of really st stuff that's just not funny from <laughs> the early years. I mean, there's stuff that's not funny from recent years, and I apologize for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, sensibilities change. There's just, you know, there's stuff that I, I'm not the biggest fan of um, from the archives, but no one really, I mean, we have tens of thousands of things in there, so I don't think there's people just 
going through it and being offended. Hopefully there's not. <laughs> um, in the back there. Uh, you, you pick. <laughs> Do you think satire is ever counterproductive? In the, it seems like Onion writers often are coming from a place of anger, or disgust, or loathing, for like the status quo for politics, for mm -hmm. the way things are. Uh, and that goes to people also have that feeling. And they pass it around on Facebook, or share it some other way, or email it around. But what might come out is anger gets turned into an outlet of comedy, and the feeling maybe becomes sort of diluted. Um, so how is that? I guess I'm not sure how that's counterproductive. I can see how that's just like not productive. Um, I, I don't know. I think I think you're right. A lot of it's written from a place of of anger. Is not. I wouldn't say it's anger usually. I would say it's just like frustration. It's um, annoyance. It's just like being tired of, of things that we think are stupid. Our motto is "Two stool to zest," which is Latin for "you are dumb." Um, so every like a lot of things we write are just an indictment of what we think is dumb, and rather than just like being passed around and diluted, I think um, a lot of us don't necessarily follow how far these things go. And for us, the writing process and seeing it go out there is just the catharsis for us. We're like, ah, oh, this is a thing that was bothering me in the world and I got to write something about it. That's, I think that's, you know, it's very validating for us. And we don't care what you guys do with it. <laughs> Have you ever had the targets of your satire kind of reach out to you and ask you to retract a like a, an article or something like that. Like for example, like there was a recent one where it was like ISIS changes its name to Google. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> that was that was click home. Click home, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, have you ever had like a company or like a, an official, you know, kind of reach out to you about this? Oh yeah. Um, we, I mean, we've had Donald Trump's legal counsel reach out to us <laughs> and, and ask us to take it. To, I mean. There, I really wish I had this email printed and re could read it to you guys. It's fantastic. Um, it was the most overblown sort of like self-important thing, being like, "You have to take this down immediately, or we're going to do all legal blah 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 blah." Um, but we don't take those down. I think for the most part, um, like I said before, we stand behind what we do, and we don't think it should come down. And we have pretty good First Amendment protections behind us. So uh, we've, I don't think we've ever taken anything down, like any article down. So I was reading <coughs> an article that you had done an interview before, and you have like an econ background, you're an yeah. analyst or an associate. Yeah, I worked at the Federal Reserve. Union. So you're kind of at this border of like political politics and comedy. Where do you see your career going, or do you have an idea? I, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, like I said before, our previous editor-in-chief um, went to John Oliver's show, which I think is would be a great place to work in terms of it, it does really good satire, um, but those are limited places. Like John Stewart's leading the Daily Show, Colbert's going to network television. I think people who do true satire are very, there are very few of them. I would say at least very few who who get out to a wide audience. So I I like The Onion. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think it fulfills my desire to be hopefully kind of funny and to um, sort of have people read my opinions, which, which I think is uh, very validating for me, very, very nice. Um, and I and feel like I'm influencing people, like millions of people um, read what we have to say on something. And I think we usually make good points. And there's, I, I just think there's very few places that can do that. So if I leave The Onion at some point, it may be to stay in satire, but there's so few options, I would probably see myself doing something possibly in public policy. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi. What's the history of the name? Ah, it's a good question. It's a great question, and I filmed, so maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't go into this. And no one's gonna watch it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's also online. Yeah, sure. Uh, the the thing that's on Wikipedia is about the dumbest explanation, and, we, and it's it's got to be wrong. I. Uh, Thing, the explanation on Wikipedia is that the two founders at the University of Wisconsin-Madison were, Madison were so poor that they just made a sandwich and instead of having meat or cheese or any stuff, they just put sliced up onions on it and ate it on bread. And for some, like one of their uncle or roommate or something said, oh, you should name your paper The Onion. 
how that would cross anyone's mind that, first of all, no one's going to eat that sandwich. Second of all, why the thing you're eating should be turned into the name of your satirical paper is beyond me. That's like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'm glad it's on Wikipedia. Um, uh, but the thing that I've heard that I actually believe is that uh, it was founded in the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it was sort of this one sheet or very, very small packet um, and it was largely done as a vehicle for selling coupons for local businesses. That's how they made money. Like businesses would pay the money to do like a coupon and get it out to the students. Uh, and they put it next to a campus bulletin, which was called the Union for the student union. And they just had a mispronunciation next to it, which is the Onion. So that's what I believe. I, I don't know if it's true. Uh, and the red coat. Uh, so I'm a couple of unrelated quick questions. Talked about the, the nine writers. What's the demographics? Men, women, um, age range? Is there sure. a lot of turnover? And my other question is: Are you print anywhere in the world? No. Uh, our print, I'll answer that one first. Our print is completely gone. The last place it held on was here in Chicago, um, and that was about November of 2013, I believe, is when it disappeared. Um, so it's completely gone. So all it is is, is digital now, which is unfortunate. Uh, demographics: nine writers. We have. One of our writers just left to go to the new Colbert show, a late, late show with Stephen Colbert, which is going to come out in September. Um, so she, she left. We have one other full-time female writer. The rest are men. Um, if you really want to go about ethnic breakdown, <laughs> so I could do that. No, no, just age um, range. And then age range. We have fellows, too. We have um, three very young fellows, 20s. But most of our writing staff is very young. Um, I'm at the higher end, and I'm 32. I think we most of our writers are between 25 and 30, and we have a couple older guys. If you guys are 40 or early 40s. Um, in the gray sweater. I think you said that uh, you thought Democrats were harder to satirize. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't say it maybe quite that way, but that's the impression. <laughs> you had. Sure. Why is that? And, and my second part of the question, which I think relates is, isn't the other side of the same coin, where are all the effective satirists on the other side? Because sure. Because I, I don't know who they are. Um, well, I, I want to point out, first of all, that we love, love making fun of people on the left. Like it gives, because people accuse us of being a little uh, left bias. And so when we can dish it back to Obama or anyone else on the left, we, it's the greatest thing in the world. Um, so I love that. It's personally one of my favorite things when we make fun of Obama. Um, but I think for the, the main reason why it seems to be generally a little harder to make fun of the left or people on the left is that um, they're, they're liberals, they're progressives, and they just generally have a broader worldview. And things that, like I said before, that we make fun of are intolerance and hypocrisy. And those tend to be... Um, slightly, like if you have a smaller, narrower worldview, you tend to fall into that camp a little more often. Um, so they tend to be the butts of our jokes a little more. Um, I feel like there's another part to your question, which yeah. I think. Who are the good conservative setters? I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we've had in the past, like, <coughs> some people with libertarian leanings on our staff, but I don't think we've ever had, like, a true... Why don't on your staff out in the world? I, I, I can't answer that either. Um, yeah. There's a, there was a good article in, I can't remember what it was, The Atlantic or something, or where they were talking about lack of conservative satirists, or just humorists in general. Maybe it was New York Times magazine. Um, but it was, it was an interesting read. I recommend it. Okay. Um, how has writing uh, satire shaped your outlook on the world, or sort of vice versa? What about your outlook on the world do you think led you to satire? Um, I'm trying to answer that second part. I, I don't know. Um, I think sort of what you were saying is that I, I feel like I'm maybe at this crossroads of, of having a political, uh, being a little more political of a person and um, trying to be funny, and that this is a good point to where these intersect. Um, I mean, I wasn't really joking about the whole public policy thing before. I almost went to school for grad school for public policy. Um, I decided not to, and then I got a job at the Onion, which was way better. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's, for me personally, why I'm drawn to it. I feel like I'm opinionated. I feel like I, I care about politics and um, 
you know, social causes, etc. And this is a way to do it. And I also just like very stupid jokes too, which which I get to do at the Onion. And how it has shaped my worldview, like the reverse of that. Um, I think that sort of goes back to that question we were talking about, like safe spaces, where I feel like now more than ever I care about um, just feeling like everything is fair game, everything's fair game to be talked about and joked about, and that we should do that. Are you over here? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So at once you say that, like, like we just said, um, everything is fair game to talk about, mm -hmm. but at the same time you also want to punch up and not punch down. Right. Um, kind of in the past month, kind of the biggest like thing in the news about satire has been Charlie Hebdo, right? right? Um, and that ignited a whole slew of like arguments about censorship, about free speech, mm -hmm. about what's okay to say, and like, whether or not you should be able to say something, even if it means hurting a group of people. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of tie kind of like to that line? Like, how do you both kind of tackle any issue? while at the same time still punching up. Sure, I think that's a very good point. Um, I think we're fundamentally different than Charlie Hebdo. Um, like I was saying before, our, our main credo is like, uh, there's nothing that's off limits, uh, and then we append this bit to it that's um, as long as we find the right angle. And I think for Charlie Hebdo, a lot of the time, they didn't have that thing appended to the end. It was just like everything, uh, nothing is off limits. And I think they also sort of to a degree reveled in their tastelessness. I think it's just a different sort of strain of satire in France um, that we don't have. We're a little more focused on what I would consider cleverness and wit, uh, and that's sort of the angle that we like to take things, like we like to go. So when Charlie Hebdo was bombed several years ago, before the gunman came in and shot like 12 people or whatever it was, um, we did have a comment on that, and we actually did have a comment after the 12 people were killed as well. Um, but that first one is one where we think that nothing's off limits, but we want to be clever and witty and not completely disrespectful for pe to people who didn't have anything to do with this. So our take was um, no one killed because of this image, and the image was this drawing that our graphics department did, which was Moses and Jesus and Buddha and Ganesh, I believe, a Hindu deity, engaged in a very graphic orgy. Um, and it just, the, the article didn't say anything um, about Islam or uh, anything. It just sort of, it said, people who see this image or these faiths will get angry, and they should get angry, um, but they'll go, they'll go on with their day. So I think we can make a comment about how, like we want to respect people's religious beliefs. We don't want to just arbitrarily make fun of religious beliefs, but we, we think that if you hold these religious beliefs and they're violated, you can be cool about it. Um, and that's the intent of our message. So I think that's an example of punching upward in a very nuanced, clever, witty way, whereas Charlie Hebdo would probably just have, you know, Muhammad getting violated in, you know, various places, which they've, which they've shown, um, which just isn't our, our style. That said, they obviously shouldn't have been shot. Um, but yeah, just different, divergent ways of doing it. Okay, for our last question, um, did you in the back have one for a while? Oh, it was basically the same question. I was just curious to know how the, um, the Onion staff like, personally reacted to the January 7th shooting of Charlie Hebdo, which we felt like as a solidarity with the victims as well as satirists, or if we just felt that their work went beyond what we would publish. Uh, I, think, I think we felt both. I mean, I think almost overwhelmingly the, the main feeling was was shock and sadness and feeling like they were there is like a brotherhood um, like I wouldn't discount that at all I mean it obviously everyone on our staff believes that they should not have been killed for what they do they just did it in a different way and France has a different history and I'm going to get very uh, intelligent on you uh, <laughs> there's there's a some there's this strain in French satire called I don't speak French, but it's like Goué or something like this, Goué, if anyone speaks French, it's like G-O-U-A-I-L-L-E, where they just have this long history of being very crass with, with what they do, there's <coughs> like these images of Marie Antoinette um, like in all, engaged in all sorts of crazy sexual acts and the devil uh, farting in the Pope's face and stuff like this. This is just sort of a history that they have there. Um, so I can't, I, I feel a little weird saying that what they were doing was 
in, in my mind, it was wrong, and we would never do that. But that that's their different strain of satire over there. Um, and I think more than anything, the, the main feeling was feeling like, yeah, they, there was a degree of solidarity with them. And we felt awful. That was an awful day, and we had, we had to do several brainstorms to come up with what we thought a good comment was on that. Um, yeah, it's a pretty terrible day. On that note, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, seriously, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much to Cole Bowen for giving us his time, and I hope you all enjoyed the event. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.